The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Is the one and only Ann Burgess. Thank you for being here. I'm happy to be here with you. Wow, so you've got quite the history in, in uh, crime and... and, and <laughs> Uh, what what got you into um, the field that you're in and, and this whole... Yeah, sure. Yeah, because I started out n never dreaming I'd get into this field. But uh, when I got into academe, which was not also not my main interest, I was interested in just being a uh, nurse psychotherapist, but was recruited into academe. And while there, met a sociologist who came to Boston College about the same time, Linda Holmstrom, who was looking for a new research project. And so when I talked with her, uh, she came up with some very interesting ideas and knew at the time that the whole issue of rape was going to be a big issue for women. And so that's where we decided to join forces, so to speak. And I went about trying to find a um, hospital emergency room where I knew victims would be taken and that led me to uh, Boston City Hospital and we made arrangements there and that's how the whole project got started. So the behavioral science unit at the FBI, um, how, did, how did you get involved with that? Right, well that came because we had done the rape study and we're starting to publish on it at the kind of the same time the women's movement was putting a lot of pressure on Congress to do something about law enforcement and dealing with victims, et cetera. So the group that does all the training for law enforcement at the time, and probably still, is the FBI Academy, the Training Academy. So they were given the task of coming up with training for the agents and for law enforcement on rape victimology. Well, then the next point is they had to find someone to teach it, and they assigned it to the newest person coming, I guess, into the academy, which happened to be Roy Hazelwood. So Roy gets this assignment. He happens to be out in Los Angeles doing a road school on hostage negotiation, and afterwards is talking with some of the uh, police officers and mentions this new assignment that he had. And when he kind of asks everybody who knows anybody that knows anything about this, one of the juvenile police officers was Rita Connect, who also had earlier been a registered nurse and who was keeping her skills up over at the local emergency room. She said she had just read this article, which happened to be the very first article that Linda and I had written and it was in the American Journal of Nursing, which is our, our main uh, journal, and it was just called The Rape Victim in the Emergency Room. So Rita said, I think this nurse is out on the East Coast. Why don't you give her a call? And Roy did and invited me down to teach on this, and that's really how it got started because I then met the other agents, which included Bob Ressler and John Douglas, who had just begun their project on the... Uh, criminal personality study on serial offenders. So what was your actual role in the uh, behavioral science unit? Well, my role then became, as I listened to them talk, I said, well, you really need to professionalize it a bit. In fact, if you look at the third episode in the first series, that is a pretty accurate about how the agents came, talked with me uh, when I was at Boston College, and... Um, I kind of impressed upon them how important it was to professionalize their their methodology, so to speak. So they asked me to help with them, and that's really how it started. We came up with a 57-page uh, questionnaire. They had to fill out, I think there were 488 variables. So we really developed quite a database. And so then my job was, after we got the assessment form, is to make sure the data get entered and then I had by that time had uh, received some money from National Institute of Justice and had a, a team, an analytic team that could then crunch down the numbers 
and come up with the, um, the, uh, the statistics, and then we wrote it up and published it as a book and also journal articles for law enforcement. So my role was really from the, the methods, methodology part and making sure that we had a good database and, and interpreting the data. That was, that was important to use behavioral terms rather than just psychological terms. That was the one thing they didn't want to do. They wanted to make it more law enforcement, um, if you will. And as John Douglas said to me one time, he says, I don't know how I can go out and find somebody who's got an Oedipus complex, you know, which was a, a kind of a psychological term at that time. He says, I need behavior. I need to... I need to know, like, what age to look for, how tall they are, what they work at, uh, what their relationships are, et cetera, et cetera. And that was really the beginning of profiling. So we really had two studies going on. We had the, the criminal personality, which was to look at 36 serial killers who had 112 victims and tell, kind of tell it, like, as, as we learned about it, since nobody was talking about sexual killers. And then the other piece was to do the profiling. How did they then take all of a, a case comes in, put all the crime scenes on the table, talk about them, and then come up with a profile? That was the second part of the project. How do you feel the FBI was, um, and and was there resistance within the FBI for what you guys were doing? Well, there was resistance in terms of make sure that you do things that, that that make us look good, so to speak, which I think everybody always wants, you know, you want to do something to make your employer look good. But it was also that they uh, had a mandate, so to speak. It was William Webster was there at the time, and he said, we want you doing research. We're an academic uh, training program and academic training programs do research. He was very right and I remember him saying to Bob Ressler you can't, don't make this shoebox research. Make sure it's very, very um, reputable and can pass the peer test, so to speak. So they had a high, it was a high bar that they wanted to do which was excellent because you certainly want research that's good. And uh, so that they didn't resist it. Once I think the director came out in in support of it, uh, they uh, the only resistance would be on the profiling. Now, are you really sure that you're pro, you know you're you're doing this profiling right? That we really are going to reduce the suspects, that uh, shrink the suspect list. I think is the way they put it. As, that was the purpose of profiling: is to reduce the number of suspects and help law enforcement to really focus in on the ones that seem to have the most characteristics from the profile. Uh, what kind of reaction did you get from your peers, like in academia and science? <laughs> well, it wasn't a popular topic. It still isn't. So there was some resistance from that standpoint. Certainly in my field, nursing, it was uh, this was kind of a new area of nurses doing this. Uh, the res uh, there wasn't too much resistance. There was, I think, one of the lucky things is we, they didn't give us a lot of attention because I don't think they were that interested. So we were able to pretty much do our counseling and, and interviewing, at least of the rape study at the hospital. And then, of course, down at the academy, they were getting so many cases in that they wanted some help. So it was a little bit different for them. They they were trying to train some people so that they they could answer these questions when. Law enforcement would say, gee, we have this case, we need to find out who's doing it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's still not popular today, even with all the TV shows and stuff? Uh, I think it's very popular today from the offender standpoint. There seems to be great fascination with crime, and I think it's for two reasons. One, just the fascination of what people do to each other. But then second of all, from a prevention standpoint, I know that when I talk about victims and, and the situations that happen to them, I know that if people are kind of storing this in their own memory to say, gee, if I'm ever in a tight situation, uh, I wonder if I could do this. Because I would always tell them the stories about the, the victims that survived and then the victims who got more injured because of something that they did 
in the commission of the offense that really set the offender off. Have you ever uh, really considered what it is that draws people to true crime? Um, if you have an opinion on that, I'd love to hear it. Well, my opinion would be, again, as you say, the fascination with it is to uh, learn something. I would hope that's what it is. Now, it may not be. I guess that would be a research <laughs> question, but it's can we learn something that will help us from a prevention standpoint? And then the other piece is, of course, that uh, how can people do what they do? Right now, I'm working with a team looking at a, an added, why does the offender not just kill the victim? Why does the offender have to do additional things to the victim, such as either rape her or, or uh, torture her or cut her up or dismember or mutilate? Why is that necessary if the intent, and clearly the intent isn't just to kill, but why would they do that? And maybe the other part is most people in, in their life are going to be a jury, a, a, a juror, in a uh, case, and that might help them as they listen to information. At least I tell my students that. I figure they all are going to be jurors at some point, so listen to the to this case and see what you think. And I will tell them. I'll say, "You're the jury now. What would you do in this in if, in this case?" Um, how do you think the field has evolved um, since you first started studying? Uh, you know the trauma and rape and and victims like this? Well, the field has really e evolved in a couple of directions. I was just doing a case this morning on an offender out of Georgia who was a, a serial killer. Uh, they called him the stocking killer, S-T-O-C-K-I-N-G, silk stockings. He would kill his victims and wrap, wrap them around his neck that way, their neck. And one of the things is there was plenty of um, forensic evidence, but they didn't have the equipment at that time to do the DNA. Nowadays, they would get that case solved in probably the, on the first or second victim because they'd have the DNA, and they would have prevented seven other uh, crimes to women, elderly women down in that area. So DNA has been a major, major technology advance, not only for identifying a suspect, but for exonerating them. That's, it's, as use, as, it's as useful to say who isn't a subject. So that's one thing, and that's in the, the forensic field has really advanced, and a lot of um, good research is going on. They can now take uh, fingerprints off of uh, all kinds of uh, samples and well, I could go on and on, but there are a lot of advances there. So that's in terms of the science piece of it. But the advances have been made also in terms of victim interviews and offender interviews and trying to prepare cases. I think prosecutors and defense attorneys have learned a lot over the years. So we see very different kinds of, very sophisticated kinds of uh, presentations coming on now. So I guess it's, and then, and then from a counseling standpoint, we have really improved how to help victims if they develop PTSD to uh, advance uh, or correct that. So I think all fronts we've made advances, say, in the last 10, 20 years. What about, what about the silent victims, the ones that are scared to report and stuff? Is there anything that's helped that come along? Well, that's a whole different matter of why, wh whether to report or not, and that's been a very serious problem for those of us who work with victims, for them to be able to come forward. And it's for a variety of reasons. It isn't for one or two reasons, but there can be a variety of reasons. Many times they're very embarrassed. Uh, they, they don't want to bring attention to themselves. But more importantly, it's one thing to have a victimization and not tell anybody because then you don't have to deal with the reaction. When you tell somebody, whether it's a, a therapist or a counselor or take it to court, then you have to deal with the social reaction. And the social reaction can be quite, can be as distressing and traumatizing. I know that we have a problem in the academic field uh, or in situations where both the victim and the offender know each other. 
and they are resistant. The military, too, is also another place where this happens because they then have to live in the situation where that the offender and victim may still be. Uh, whether that's if, if you're in academia, it can be classes in the military, it can be under a command or a, you know whatever. So it's very complicated when the offender is known. When the offender isn't known, it's easier for someone to come forward. But we've tried to help victims, and we often, or not we, but the uh, attorneys will do a Jane Doe case. So her name is never used, or his name is never used. It will be John or Joe Jane Doe. And that's one way to protect the victim uh, from public recognition. Yeah, there's been a big rise in, in military sexual assaults, uh, I've noticed through the media a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's why do you think that's happening? Uh, a couple of reasons. For also, in the uh, not just the military, but athletics and sports, and sometimes I think it's because of the um, kind of the culture. The culture is all male very often, or used to be all male. So they have a very kind of different set of rules and what constitutes what. Um, then the other piece is that the victim, because they they are a well-known person, and it's going to be somebody that knows them. You know, it's not going to be a not usually going to be a stranger, and it can be in the military because somebody is a rank above them, and so bringing any kind of a charge against a, a higher rank is going to have its problems. And given the culture. I know I've worked some cases it has been unbelievable what the higher ranks will say. It's like, you, you're making too much of this, or you're a soldier, you know, you can't be, uh, what are you complaining about? Um, those kinds of very demeaning statements are made to, to the person making a report. And that's not just the female. It can be a male in, in the military. But females have not been in the system that much so I think that that's beginning to maybe that's beginning to change but on on deployments it can be a real serious problem I could give you all kinds of really chilling stories that I've heard that I have no reason not to believe and and many times I fully understand why a victim doesn't come forward with it that's not helpful of course for getting getting the offender and so what the military has done now, I think, is a good thing, is that they, you could make an anonymous third-party report, uh, third report so that you don't have to identify yourself, but you can, um, it can, at least the person can be identified. And, and I, I would imagine um, it could really be hard on a victim especially if, it, if they're going against someone in the public, because we saw that with, with the uh, swearing in of Justice Brett Kavanaugh, remember, with the... Uh, right, absolutely, uh, yeah. And, and, and do people really understand it? Like, when, when we see that, and when that was going on, there was a lot of talk, like, uh, you know, that the woman couldn't remember enough, and, and uh, different details and stuff, so it couldn't have happened. And, but, but that's not true, is it? Well, um, what you're describing is, is kind of a, it's what we call a delayed disclosure that can take, and it, it depends on how delayed it is. Obviously, if it's weeks or months, it's not much. But if you've got years built up, as you say, memory can be, can be faulty uh, for pieces. Memory can be faulty uh, suffering a trauma. So we have a number of factors that play against that whole bringing up and making a, a complaint. But you're right, it created a lot of uh, uh, emotion as well as, as discussion, sure. And then that what followed, I think that had, the Me Too movement had been before that, right? And then, yeah. and then the cabinet, yeah. So, so the, the kind of culture was already stirred up because of women, I think, yeah, I think there were all women coming forward on prominent persons in the entertainment field. Yeah. And then this, and then that case. So you always want to look at the context and the that that a case will come up within. That's going to be still be a big problem of, of believing the victim or believing the person that's claiming the assault. It's always been a problem. It's always been there. 
as long as I've been in the field, and I've been in quite a while, it's always been a problem. I can remember if more li- more in the beginning, if, I, if somebody would call me on a case, they would say, "Do you believe her? Do you believe you know? Do you believe this happened?" It was very important, and I can understand that. Of course, if they're an attorney, they didn't want to. They, they were not that. It wasn't. There wasn't a lot of education out on that yet, and so I could understand it. But I still get it that um, because nobody wants to put a lot of energy into a case and then find out it didn't happen or that the victim wouldn't come forward or you know something like that. So you're right; it's it's a it's been an issue and it still is an issue. Yeah, yeah. There's something something in um, society because even even people having fake hate crimes and setting up things and, and yep. going to great lengths to uh, yep. try to try to make themselves look like a victim. Yeah, very, very true. Yeah. W- what was your um, initial reactions to the Mindhunter series when it came out? Uh, well, I was curious. I was interested, uh, of course. And uh, John Douglas had, had told me it was coming. It, in fact, I, th- it, I thought it was rather delayed that it was supposed to have come out earlier. I don't know. But anyway, it finally came out. And as I said, I I was more, well, a couple of reactions. First, they didn't have me with the, in the right profession. I am a nurse, a psychiatric nurse, and they had me as a psychologist. And I, I, uh, I, it's, you know, obviously I can't correct that, but I, I hope that I've said it enough that if they ever identify me again, they'll identify me as a nurse. Uh, <laughs> but um, I was more, then I was interested in how accurate, how accurate were they for the cases, because we had worked so hard on the data, and I knew these cases inside and out. And I, I have to say they were pretty accurate. Uh, they got the key factors in. They, of course, had to play Hollywood and dress them up, you know, in some different type of context. But as to the actual facts of the case, I thought they were pretty pretty uh, accurate. So you feel pretty good about it? Well, I think, I think it taught things. I thought it, it added a dimension. Our work had been used and is still used in criminal minds. It, doesn't, it didn't get the play that uh, Mindhunter did, but in criminal minds, if you notice, if you remember back to some of the early shows, they would always start off with the victimology. They'd always do the profile. You'd see the one of the, of the uh, uh, actors standing up and saying, let me look for this, and da-da-da, and go on down. So I, I thought that had gone well, but then, of course, as the years went on, they had to kind of up the, the, the quality of it or however you want to call it. So it's, um, I don't know where it's at now, but at least in Mindhunter, I know that they were basing it on actual cases, and that I thought was very important and, and good. So did you ever get a chance to actually participate in one of the serial killer interviews as is portrayed in the show? Not for Mindhunter. I did, of course, knew all the data, and we talked about all of the cases, et cetera, in, in writing up the, the book. We did a book, you know, out of that. <laughs> as, uh, what does, as Holden says, a book? Yes, I was yeah. a book. And it wasn't Mindhunter. It was another book. But at any rate, uh, we did that. And, and um, was that sexual ahead. homicide patterns and motives? That's it, yeah. That's the yeah. academic part of the book. And then, of course, John wrote the Mind Hunters. Now, the Mind Hunters, they were, the agents were all called Mind Hunters at the time back in the 80s. So that's the uh, title he took for his book, yeah. So, uh, now, a lot of the different um, um, things you came across in the show. Um, it, it almost seemed like you were just kind of stumbling your way onto different phenomenon. Uh, is that sort of how it really happened, or what? What? What did happen? Well, what did happen? Well, we. It, this was an academic exercise, so you take data, you crunch it down, and then you look at your you look at your findings, and then you have to make the interpretation. So. Uh, that's essentially what we did. We were always, uh, my goal, and I hope I reached it, was to always look at the patterns and the motives. That's, I was looking for pattern. That's what I had done in the rape study on rape trauma syndrome, was looking at the patterns. And I think that, and then we decided, and we wrote a number of papers from the homicide data, 
but then we how do we put it into a book and we put it in pretty much those chapters or how do these how do these killers grow up what was unique or not unique and then what made the difference and i think that's what our major contribution was was how they thought from an early age about killing because most kids don't think and fantasize about killing but these 36 men did and then uh, we had to explain why did they keep killing once it's one thing to kill once but why keep doing it and that's where we came up with what we call the motivational model of how that's a circular in the heads of these guys to make them com- be very compulsive to keep killing were you and in fact part- okay. I'm sorry sorry yeah. uh, were you able to maintain always maintain a clinical um, approach to this did it ever personally bother you the the gruesome details that you were dealing with day to day? Well, all murder bothers me. Um, so yes, I'd have to say that that it's it's a terrible uh, behavior that occurs to a person. But I was as interested in getting the information out to see if we could prevent it, if we could get to these people earlier and get mental health to understand it or law enforcement of how to approach these situations and often to look and see if you can see the pattern and then figure out the suspect through the profiling. So I was, uh, and I think our whole team was caught up in that of having the larger goal to get this done. But at, a, at, at an individual level, these were terrible cases, terrible cases of what happened to women and children predominantly and not so many men. Men get murdered but not sexually murdered. So uh, the character that um, is kind of um, who you're supposed to be in the in the uh, mine hunters. I'm I'm wondering. Um, she was fairly strong and independent in that show. Um, did you were you one of the only few females in in the FBI and in, in that department at the time? Uh, pretty much. Now they the females they had were the support staff. So, you know, you had females, but they were at a level, not at an agent level. Uh, they were the, the secretaries, administra- uh, administrative assistants, that type. As far as the agent went, um, they started, I remember, I remember three that came in in the time I was there, but it was unusual for a female uh, to come in, mainly because in the FBI you had to serve in another, you had to kind of go through the ropes and serve in a different capacity. And then to get to the academy, you had to have a lot of experience. So um, there were none in the program at the time I was there, but as I said, more came in. And now I think it's quite uh, it's quite diverse. Wow. Well, um I just, I, you know, it's amazing. Um, now, what do you think of the series overall? Uh, the Mindhunter series, the uh, series overall? Yeah. Um, like, what well, do you hope series, people get? I hope people get, uh, well, first of all, from the first, first series, uh, the one that was last year, the first series, I think what they showed were the ways of interviewing and some of the reactions that the offenders had. And I think that's good, of, of, that it's not very easy for the agents to go in and just sit down and talk to these uh, men. And they certainly learned very quickly, if you read Ressler's book, that they always would send two in, that to send one person in, that put Ressler in a really tight situation. And so they always send two in, which makes sense. Um, so that was, I think that's what was taught, the the way they, and the, the ones they did were the main ones we had. That would have been uh, Risso, uh, Monty Risso, who was a uh, rape murderer, and then uh, I always combine him or compare him with Ed Kemper, who was a lust murderer, who would have killed and then done things to the body. And then you had Brutus, the, the shoe fetish. I mean, they really did mix and match there uh, in that whole first episode. In the second episode, um, they have gone to different types of offenders. I think Manson and, and I forget all of them. But um, 
So they're doing a a different way, which I think is good to mix them up a bit. And I have no idea what they're going to do for a third episode. There were only 36, but John Douglas has many more cases that he had done while he was in the Bureau, more than the 36 that we studied. So I think that, that they, and they have drawn from that population. Now, I've done my own. You asked about mine. I've done my own cases since all of that because I certainly learned a lot in, in, um, in interviewing and putting a case together. You had some sort of um, involvement in the satanic panic abuse cases, didn't you? Um, not in the satanic cult stuff. I, uh, I did a couple of preschool, pre-kindergarten cases, like daycare cases, right. and I did them at three separate federal agencies because I was asked to come in and, and help. Uh, uh, they they seem to have some satanic features to it, but in one of the cases it was uh, just young people who were the caretakers or the workers there who were scaring the kids and using that uh, so it wasn't a real... I, I never worked a whatever would be considered a real cold case, no. Wow. And now false sexual um, abuse claims. Have you dealt with a lot of that? False sexual abuse claims. I've done, uh, well, I did the um, Duke Lacrosse case. That was a big major one. That's probably the most major one. I certainly have done some others where there has been an allegation of sexual abuse and not necessarily uh, followed through. Did we get the evidence for it? So I'd have to say the Duke Lacrosse case was the main one I did. Wow. So what do you do um, nowadays? Are you still writing books or are you um, doing speeches or what kind of work are you doing now? All of the above. I <laughs> teach, of course, I, <laughs> I teach, um, I have five courses I teach at Boston College and they're in the, in the forensic field. One's victimology where each week we do a different type of victim then in the spring, I do the offender. Each week, we do the uh, crime case from the offender standpoint. And then I do forensic science, which is putting the case together, and I do a lab. Um, <clears throat> so I, I teach, and I still do cases, and I do speaking. Uh, pretty much all that I've always done. Well, that's pretty amazing. Now, do you have a website? No. No, oh, staying away from the... No. Uh, <laughs> I don't even have an iPhone. Oh, you're oh. smart. <laughs> I stay away from that. I don't need anything extra <laughs> to, to take my concentration away. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, do you have any influences that um, have really affected your life? Any influences? Um, well, like... My, uh, my professional work, working with crime victims, certainly has. Um, the other thing I do that I like to, I'm, I'm actually trying to get a replication study to do, is I've had a great interest in veterans and veterans coming back into academe and trying to be absorbed into the academic setting. So I have my student athletes, I pair them with a veteran, and they have a workout twice a week, and then we put them, bring them over for a little class use um, any type of, of, of uh, faculty. I get my faculty to come in and talk. And uh, then that has worked really well. And it's something that I feel nursing can do for the ac from an academic standpoint uh, within to encourage more coming back. And <clears throat> BC has just has, has its own now uh, advisory board for veterans and is making a real concerted effort to make veterans feel comfortable coming back into uh, finishing their degree. Wow. Now, now your last book was in 2013, uh, Crime Classifications Manual. Um, That's true. Now, um, what is it that you wrote that book for? Like, what, what were you wanting to get across to people? 
Well, that was uh, trying to, uh, to uh, if you will, kind of mimic what the DSM is to mental health, a diagnostic and statistical manual, where at, at the time a, crime was, um, a murder was a murder and rape was a rape, and they didn't have any way of classifying it. So you really can't do treatment or intervention or understand cases if you just have a kind of a, a, a conglomeration of, of a type. So we tried to separate out and, and, and make categories. So that's what that was about. That was the first one. Now it's up to the third edition, and it's just on kind of an encyclopedia of types of crimes. I read it at the second edition, and I'm, I'm a big crime nerd, so <laughs> I, re- I, I really dug it. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's not for yeah. it's not for everybody, obviously, because no, it's it's no. dense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I said yeah. It's an academic book. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, or se- <laughs> we make se- dense books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it, it, or the sexual homicides and sexual, um, let's say, um, crimes. Are they evolving or changing through time? Oh, I think they are. In fact, we have a conference coming up called The Evolution of Evil, and the speakers we have out of Columbia University, Michael Stone, who is a psychiatrist, and Gary Brucata, who is a psychologist, mm. have We've spent a lot of time. Oh, good. Okay. So you yeah. know what they've done. But there's your... And, and they ha- make the point that they um, they do think that there have been changes, and I would agree in our culture that we are seeing different kinds of cases. Just a, a, one little tiny group that I, I had worked with the National Center Missing Exploited Children when we were looking at just infant abductions, little babies being stolen from hospitals. And then pretty soon we began to see that there was what they call fetal abduction, where women are going in and literally uh, cutting into the uterus of a pregnant woman to steal a baby. That's new, and that's almost doubled in the last uh, five or ten years. So what's going on, you know, that, that, that kind of phenomenon? And then the whole dismemberment, if you've talked with... Uh, with uh, Stone and Bacotta, they're, they're, they looked at the whole dismemberment issue. That's, that, you, you almost can see it once a week, some place in the United States is reporting a case. So that'll be in, uh, on Saturday, October 5th at Boston yeah. College. Yeah. Oh, at BC, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. Very, very, quite the subject. Um, how do you stay happy? <laughs> How do you stay happy? How do you stay happy? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. How do you stay happy? Uh, wow, you know. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, it's. It, have you? <laughs> I don't, are you surprised at how big it's gotten? You know, on TV, it's on movies. It's there's. Oh, I know. I know. I, I just, why? Yeah. Why? You know, what is the the big draw? It it is something that people get of all ages, pretty much mm-hmm. all ages. People get drawn to it, yeah. Interestingly, for for me, I'm a, a host of a, a true crime podcast, and uh-huh. I would say ninety percent or better of my listeners are women. Really? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, huh. yeah. So there's a. Uh, I'm often thinking, what is what is that? Uh, and a lot of it is probably what you've mentioned. Most of the victims are are women or children. Oh, women. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. the children, child victims. That's a really. That's a. You talk about tough uh, cases. They're tough. They're very tough. Oh, it's got to be. Everybody is affected by them. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's certainly been interesting, and we okay. really appreciate you okay. coming on and talking about uh, well, th- this happy Christmas subject. Yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And we wish you nothing but the best. And, uh, well, thank and, you. And again, our guest has been Ann Burgess. And um, wow, we'll have your books and everything posted up on our site so people can do one click and oh, pick up a book. Good. And and, um, and look for the next one, tell and them. And look for the next one. It's there you go. Going. <laughs> okay, thank you for inviting me. I okay. really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. It's been Take fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. 
This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.